Right. Um, I will talk about how to make banks socially useful, and I'll make the case for local banking. And as by now I think you realize this also means local money. Lord Adair Turner has been cited before, and uh, he's one of the, uh, I think, great supporters of new and interesting thinking uh, on these topics. Um, and he has said on the record that uh, he feels currently in the UK the banks are not socially useful. And that is quite a radical thing to say for the um, chairman of the FSA, the regulator um, of the banking sector. So that raises these questions. Well, what makes banks socially useful? What's the right size? He was saying they're too big to be socially useful. So the issue of size was raised. And there's been a, a debate about uh, you know, banks being too big. What's, what's the, what are the arguments behind that? What are the effects of size and banking? And so how can we reform the banking sector to make it uh, contribute better to society? Well, of course, no need to reiterate and um, for the sake of lack of time, we're, we're aware of the shortcomings of the UK banking sector, uh, the link to boom-bust uh, cycles, crises, uh, the focus we've uh, heard already today and also yesterday on um, large-scale financial sector lending as opposed to other lending of the type Triodos Bank, for example, is doing. So there's, there's a bias among the large banks against that and, and focusing on financial speculation. And, of course, also very much in the media, the lack of bank lending to small firms, the local regional economy and sustainable development. So what do banks do? What is their key function? Well, we've had this question in the earlier session. Well, how does this link into what mainstream economists are saying? And you've, you've already heard an alternative view of what banks are doing. Um, and, and there seems to be very little uh, resonance in, in mainstream economics of, of this representation, what I think is other facts of banking. So just, just in response to that and recap, this is how Banking is represented um, in textbooks. Banks collect savings. Savers are ultimately the ones that have the money. And they can put them with the banks as deposits. Uh, there's a reserve requirement in many countries. Um, in the UK currently, it's, I mean, it's, over, over time it's been reduced and reduced in the UK. It's zero now, um, which somewhat weakens the main, mainstream textbook <laughs> argument. Uh, it's still in the textbooks. Actually, I must say, it's in those textbooks that still have money and banks in them because, of course, there are many mainstream textbooks, particularly at the master's level and PhD level, that don't have banks and then they don't even have money in them. Um, so <laughs> for, these are sort of the better textbooks that have something on banking. Um, so there's a reserve requirement, say 1%. That's realistic for those countries that have a reserve requirement. And so if a bank receives £100 in new deposits from the savers, it gives £1 to the central bank and £99 are then lent out by the bank. And so the banks are intermediaries taking the money in and handing it out. Whereas, as was also another question early on that hadn't been answered, so I'll, I'll do the answer, answering part of this. Um, what about direct finance by companies when they issue bonds? This is considered so-called direct financing. Um, because companies, the, the ultimate borrowers, uh, investors that put money to use, we're, so we're told in the textbooks, they can issue bonds and the so savers can buy these, say, corporate bonds. I mean, you know, as we all know, we you know, frequently buy corporate bonds. When's the last time you bought a corporate bond? Um, but anyway, it doesn't have to be retail purchases, of course, so let's grant them this simplification. So this is called direct financing. The banks are the indirect um, finance sector. And then over the last 20 years, this paradigm that actually banks are just intermediaries, in fact, cumbersome old-fashioned intermediaries, um, has been pushed also on other countries, many developing countries, emerging markets, and also in Asia, even the very successful economies in East Asia. So when the Asian crisis happened, we had 
leaders, world leaders in sort of economic decision making, uh, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, uh, the US Treasury Secretary, Under Secretaries of State and, 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 making a whole number of claims that this crisis is due to the Asian countries relying too much on banks as opposed to direct financing in the stock market or corporate bond market. Banks as such are always unstable and unreliable. Of course, there's a lot of truth in, um, in this claim. Um, so the solution is, it was said, and also yesterday we had a member of the MPC at the Bank of England basically arguing along those lines, to go more for direct finance, securitization, offer for small firms the ability to borrow directly by issuing bonds, um, and basically not use banks. And of course, there was the argument, particularly popular, uh, emerging from America, that we need more sophisticated financial products, derivatives, credit derivatives, even what the banks are doing can be securitized and sold off uh, the CDS, CDO derivatives that by now have become a household name because of their involvement um, in the crisis. And this sort of system that relies less on banks will deliver more growth and more stability, we were told. And of course, um, it was an attractive sort of system that was offered particularly by American banks. Um, there was an extension of credit <laughs> that later turned out to be toxic waste, um, which was transferred into AAA rated assets. Um, and the banks made a lot of profit, but it didn't quite work out in the end. Um, now, the mainstream economists couldn't really handle it. So when they had the crisis and the journalists were calling them, say, professor of economic, macroeconomics at MIT or Harvard, um, and they were asked, well, can you comment on this banking crisis? Lehman's just gone bust. If they were honest, they would have said, I'm sorry, no. Uh, my economic theories don't include banks. <laughs> I suspect they may have been fudging um, that point. But we have a lot of mainstream economists on the record now saying things like um, there's been a problem. Banks have been excluded. This is the vice chairman of the Fed, Donald Korn, saying that the problem has been that central banks, and this is what a lot of academic, uh, academic economists look at for, for guidance to how they should research, uh, central banks, they're supposed to be the experts on the monetary sector, have economic models with only a limited role for credit provision and financial intermediation. And that is, of course, central bank understatement. Uh, no role for banks. And this whole issue of credit supply and the link to asset prices and economic activity was not well captured in, the, in those models. It wasn't part of those models. So there's, there is an increasing recognition, and that's the good thing of this, this banking crisis. Um, empirically, even in the mainstream economic literature, it has been clear that there has been an anomaly, a, a problem, because empirically banks can be shown and have been shown to be special in, in some ways. They have some kind of monopoly power, which you can show empirically using data, as, say, Farmer, a mainstream neoclassical economist, has done, Ashcraft, Federal Reserve staffer, has shown for example, when small regional banks go bust, um, the economy suffers, which is quite obvious to everyone, but that shows that there is something that can't be replaced easily. Um, so why is that? And of course, you've heard the answer, but now just to pose this in um, comparison to the mainstream story, where we have a new deposit of £100 with the bank, and we're told it gives then £1 to the central bankers' reserve, and it lends 99 pounds. It's just not true. It, you see, the methodology used in mainstream is the deductive methodology, which doesn't start out with looking at reality and facts. It says, oh, we, we have axioms. Axioms are things that we know to be true. And they're so true, and we know them so much to be true, that we never have to check whether they're actually true. <laughs> and by the way, they're not true. And then we add assumptions to this. And assumptions are things that from the outset we know are not true, but what the heck, let's just build a model based on them. So this, this construct would not come up with the idea of how reality works, because reality is just so quirky. You know, a logical deduction from first principles wouldn't deliver the banking system that we have. So it wouldn't occur to economists. What actually happens is when you have a new deposit of 100 pounds, 
with a bank is that, and we have a reserve requirement of 1%, for sake of argument, um, not one pound is given to the central bank, but the entire 100 deposit. And the bank then says, well, that's my 1% reserve. All right, and so we've got the new deposit, 100 pounds, and immediately the deposit with the central bank, double entry uh, booking, as, as Josh pointed out. So how much can the bank now lend? If the 100 is the 1% of 10,000, minus the 100 given to the central bank, means 9,900. And how is this done? The moment you get your, your loan contract signed, the moment you sign, the bank can put this on the asset side as an asset, and then it has to invent the liability for the balance sheet to balance. Well, you will ask, can I have, please have the money? I don't care about the accounting. And the bank will say, we've just put it into your account. They may even say erroneously, we've transferred it into your account. There's no transfer. They just write the figure. Somebody types it in. Um, so this is how it actually works. And the reason why this is not recognized is the fundamental uh, flaw in the methodology in economics. Uh, but and this is why, of course, talking about this and educating econ economists is very important. Uh, there is no such thing as a bank loan. There is only bank credit creation. So that's, this is what makes banks special. And so the majority of the money supply is created by the banking system. Uh, Schumpeter already pointed out, uh, 1954 was posthumously published, um, it's proved extraordinarily difficult for economists to recognize that bank loans create deposits because of their flawed methodology, the deductive methodology. So they're not intermediaries. In fact, the whole concept of indirect finance versus direct finance um, is wrong. And so when the question was raised, you know, um, can't we just have bonds and corporate bonds? What about those? Or what Adam Posen said yesterday, shouldn't we have just issuance of uh, um, debt securities for small firms and enable them to to raise money that way. Well, of course, that can help um, for in individual cases. But we know for the whole economy, this can't replace the monetary system that we have. Because to have what we call growth within the standard definitions, and they're clearly limited, and there's many problems with the concept of GDP. But within the system, to have GDP growth, you must have growth in the money supply. And the system is designed such that this is only possible if we have bank credit creation. So the banking sector, including the central bank, and the banks are the vast majority, have to create the money supply. Um, and banks are not financial intermediaries. They're the creators of the money supply. And so the difference to bond finance, securities finance, is that doesn't create money. So it's a transfer of existing purchasing power. This is also the problem with... Um, the idea of, of local currencies, um, the, the way it's currently being done is that, there, of course, there's a one-to-one -one exchange rate to the, to the pound. And so they're, they're not quite the same. They're a substitute. They may attract transactions to the region, but that's shifted away from other parts of the economy, which may still be very useful, but it can't substitute for what we require for growth in the current system, and that is money creation. Um, now, the credit creation, the money creation system can be divided into transactions that are um, good, if you want, that contribute to GDP and investment and, and sustainable growth, and transactions that don't even contribute to GDP and are not sustainable, the bad ones shown in red here. So credit for financial circulation, credit for real transactions is total credit, and that determines growth. So GDP growth... Um, nominal GDP growth is a function of credit for um, GDP transactions. And this explains in the, this debate um, among economists the many puzzles that exist with the standard macroeconomic models that they can't explain because they don't have credit creation um, in their theories. So there's three, three cases. Um, we can have growth without inflation, the good scenario, the green scenario, productive credit creation when... Uh, the banks create credit, give a loan for the creation of new goods and services and increases in productivity. That's non-inflationary. Because this is the first worry once you start about money creation. It's, well, isn't it going to create inflation? Well, if we have uh, productive activities, 
um, funded with new money. We've got more money, but more goods and services, no inflation. If we create credit for consumption, we've got more goods and services, the same amount of, uh, sorry, we, we don't have more goods and services, but more money, we must have consumer price inflation. And you can show this empirically, how nominal GDP is explained by credit for GDP transactions. And of course, when credit is used for financial transactions, we must have asset bubbles, and, and they are essentially the same. Adam Posen was making the case yesterday that housing is, is different somehow, and of course, for individuals in the housing sector, it, you know, it is different, but it, macroeconomically, um, the mechanism is the same. So credit for uh, property transactions explains property prices up and down the cycles. This is Japanese data because the Japanese macro data has been the biggest puzzle of all in macroeconomics and for the longest time period, for decades. And so if, a, if there's an alternative theory and it can explain the Japanese case, I think that's the strongest argument in its favor. So when credit for financial transactions rises as a share of total credit, and when total credit growth is ahead of GDP growth, you know you're creating a bubble. And this can be outside the housing market, like in the US in the 20s, um, as Anne also pointed out, and as I pointed out yesterday, this, um, you know, Adam was making the case that it's mainly housing, but it can be stocks, and that can have a devastating impact on the economy, um, resulting in when the bubble bursts, unemployment, and many problems. In the UK, credit for financial circulation has grown vastly uh, faster than um, GDP, and so it was clear that that was an unsustainable bubble. It's always unsustainable in macroeconomic terms. So this is a warning signal. If you look at Europe um, and you've, you've wondered, so what's, you know, what's the story then? Ireland, Spain, Greece, all that. Well, it's the same story. When broad credit grows faster than nominal GDP, you're creating a bubble that's unsustainable. And of course, when that bursts, you have your, your crisis. Um, Spain, credit growth was 20-25% for many years. Whereas if in Germany, as a counterexample, as in Germany, credit growth is in line with GDP growth, then you don't have an asset bubble, which is what happened there. And unfortunately, in the UK, bank asset to GDP ratio is one of the highest um, in, in Europe, in the world, in fact. Now, credit creation is a public privilege, and we can organize the economy and the system differently. <coughs> This privilege has been granted on the implicit understanding that banks won't misuse it or use it against the public that granted it. But because the public has forgotten or was never aware about this, um, there hasn't been any checks and balances. Regulators haven't even asked banks to use their power to create and allocate money and reshape the economic landscape wisely, i.e. lend for productive purposes. Um, that's what we need. We need an intervention. We need regulation that encourages or forces banks um, to lend only for productive purposes, defined here, obviously, as sustainable as well, environmentally sustainable. Otherwise, how can it be truly productive? Um, so as a result, banks, and he, I think you really can't blame the bankers, they've done what the incentive structure tells them to do, create credit for where they get the biggest profits, financial speculation. So the policy recommendation and the, what the, the agenda for um, reform is, Number one, we need to have direct intervention in the core driving causal factor here, and that is credit creation. And fortunately, there is a long empirical history of credit controls or credit guidance, a somewhat more acceptable expression. Um, many countries have used it, and it's, it's in fact the only form of bank regulation that has an empirical track record of working and doing the job. The tool can be used for bad results when you, have, when you set bad goals, as happened in Japan um, in the 80s and 90s. But the tool worked extremely efficiently. Um, and of course, it, this has been used in the UK. It's known as the corset, but was deregulated away um, in the 1970s. But many, many countries have used it, and particularly in East Asia, it's been at the core of the East Asian economic miracle. Shouldn't we look at countries that have grown so successfully if not, unfortunately, entirely environmentally friendly, but um, that's something that can also be changed. The tool is neutral in that question, and that's been credit guidance or window guidance, as it's called in China, Japan, and Korea, at the core of, of their fast uh, growth stories. So what are the policy lessons? 
how to avoid the crisis, well, restrict credit to financial speculation. You don't need the other policies. And you can have a different type of banking sector. Look at Germany. If you look at the percentage shares of uh, different types of banks, you see that what in, in the UK are the high street banks, six banks accounting for 90% of banking. In Germany, they're 13%. That's it. This is Commerzbank, Deutsche Bank type of banks. 70% is small local banks. And that's why in Germany, even without direct credit guidance and credit controls, there hasn't been an asset bubble. Because these local banks, credit unions, cooperative banks, with headquarters locally, hence my question to Triodos, the local loan officers making the decisions, they're not interested in large-scale financial speculative loans. They want to lend to local businesses, and that's almost always, by definition, more productive. Um, and so in the UK, we've got this puzzle. Uh, there are actually financial institutions that don't have big bonuses, that don't lend for speculation, that offer simple products, um, and they're interested in individuals, um, small firms. They're the credit unions, but they're less than 1% of the banking sector, whereas in Germany, they're 30%. Why is that? Legislation. Quantitative restrictions, largely due, I believe, to the banking lobby um, because of the banks being very influential in funding political parties. So we need further reform of the laws. It's a law that credit unions are so restricted. Um, and it's not justifiable. Many countries, even Ireland, the US, have bigger um, chunks of uh, credit unions uh, as part of the banking sector. So then to summarize and end my presentation, since I'm out of time, the first reform proposal is to end the suppression and repression of the third sector, the mutual cooperative credit union sector, and introduce hundreds, if not thousands, why not, of cooperative mutually locally owned municipality, city owned credit unions and banks. That will already solve many problems and is not costly to do. Secondly, introduce a regime of credit guidance. That doesn't cost anything, can be done top down through the Bank of England, will have immediate impact and deliver immediate results. These are the two modest reform proposals because you can do it almost overnight at almost no cost and get results. You can go beyond that and you should think and do go beyond that. Return the power to create and allocate money to the people because it, this privilege belongs to the people. Introduce state money and Ben Dyson has made an eloquent uh, pitch for that. This has all the advantages, what I've earlier said, without the remaining disadvantages, the seniorage loss of uh, private money. But of course, by having local banks, we can, these are just examples of state money, you know, it has been done, state of Guernsey, uh, the UK, the US. Um, but by having local banks, we have our local currency because banks create money. So that's something we can, we can perhaps do first. Uh, first of all. Ultimately, we should devolve controls to local communities and have true regional local currencies. Why not? State money on the local level. Um, there's also empirical precedents. All these have historical examples that work very well. Uh, in the 1930s, the so-called miracle of Virgil, the small town in Austria, um, that just started to print money at, an, at a time of 30-40% unemployment. And they almost moved to full employment. That's when the central bank moved in. Um, and they almost got arrested. And it was abolished. And they went back into unemployment. So think about these things. Thank you very much.